Hi and welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist with an interest in all things anti-aging. And today I'm talking to a dermatologist who raised a lot of eyebrows and some cheers among colleagues when she published a book called The Skincare Hoax, in which she set out to debunk beauty myths and anti-aging fairy tales dreamt up by marketeers. Dr. Fane Fry is a New York-based board-certified dermatologist with over 30 years of experience of working with thousands of patients. She has a keen interest in chemistry and skincare formulation, and as a result, she founded the Fry Face website, listing products that have been tried and tested, and she says, deliver against their marketing claims. And in this interview, we talk about the clinical experience and research that led her to the conclusion over what the real fountain of youth is when it comes to skincare. Dr. Fry, thank you so much for joining me on the channel. It is really a pleasure to have you here. It's my pleasure to be here with you, Claire. I've read your book, uh, The Skincare Hoax, and um, I mean, I really enjoyed it. I, I particularly enjoy A Straight Talker. And um, I gathered from the book that you were pretty unimpressed with the skincare industry as a whole. And I wondered, you know, to what extent you think the consumer is, uh, is being played uh, by an industry that's kind of, you know, tapping into our, our insecurities and inventing new skin problems all the time to provide solutions for, as opposed to an industry that's actually just responding to incredible demand from consumers who, who actually want to be sold to and are pushing the industry further and further in pursuit of anti-aging solutions. Where do you think the balance lies there? Who, who's driving what? The skincare industry is a fantastic industry. Mm -hmm. um, it makes great products, and we all know this. It makes sunscreens, which are beneficial. It makes moisturizers that we need, uh, cleansers. It's an industry that really makes really good products. So mm. I don't want to villainize the industry. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, the marketing has gone mad, and mm -hmm. it's a business. Skincare companies have to advocate, as you know, for their shareholders. And as any good business does, they want market share. Yeah. And they will push the boundaries um, to get that market share. And my goal is to is to educate. You know, we have we have great products from a great com great industries that um, are advocating for shareholders. And we have another unique situation with skincare in that the consumer doesn't understand the ingredient listing. So it's a blind item. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. How many people understand isopropyl myristate or triethanolamine or, you know, this is what's in these products. And yes, you pick on individual ingredients, but for the most part, you don't know what's in those skincare products. So they have a huge advantage. Yeah. And so my goal is to advocate for the consumer. And yes, I make I try to make people think about things they don't necessarily think about certain principles of science. Um, and uh, I ask people to, to keep an open mind. You've tested out a lot of things um, over the years. And I, I think you have a website that where you, where you make recommendations. Um, you know, having tested everything, what do you use day to day? What's your skincare routine? Uh, well, my skincare routine is very simple. I'm a huge proponent of sunscreen. Um, mm -hmm. Sunscreen is a drug regulated as a drug in the United States. It is regulated as a cosmetic in the EU, but mm -hmm. the sunscreen filters, I believe, have to be get pre-market approval. So in, in a lot of ways, it's very similar. Um, and I'm a firm believer in sunscreen, and we can go over some of that data if you'd like. Uh, and I live a healthy lifestyle. I mean, that's my answer. I get good nights of sleep. I'm an avid runner every morning. I get plenty of exercise. I try to eat in a healthy diet, although I do cheat sometimes. <laughs> we all cheat. <laughs> Even a huge dose of laughter. I don't have any science to prove laughter is great for you, but I am a firm believer that laughing is just fantastic. And do, so you don't go in for, um, I mean, I noticed in the book, actually, that you said potentially we over cleanse our skin. Now, I am somebody who just has to wash my face every day, twice a day. So I try and, you know, use a mild cleanser and all the rest of it. But I mean... Do you cleanse? Presumably you moisturize. Do you moisturize every day or what? So I cleanse when with water, right? There's no science right. that shows you have to use a cleanser on your face. Mm -hmm. This is, again, more cultural than, than science. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a lot of the ads are more about sales than science. And I have to I have to preface that with I'm not talking about hand washing, right? Hand yeah. washing. There's great science at hand washing around food preparation, using facilities, hand washing. Um, 
has probably done more for world health than any drug on the market. But mm-hmm. aside from hand washing, actually putting a cleanser on the face, um, there's very little science that shows it's beneficial. And mm-hmm. cleansers, remember, are designed to remove things. Now, your desire is to remove the dirt and the yeah. sebum and the oil. Mm-hmm. I get that. Mm-hmm. But if you have healthy skin, and I'm not talking people with acne or uh, inflammatory skin conditions, women or men with healthy skin, that cleanser can't distinguish moving the oil and the dirt from removing the lipids and the proteins that are helpful for your skin. And so you get a drying effect and sometimes an irritating effect. Mm. So do you need to use a cleanser? No, I use water-based makeup. Uh, I use uh, in the shower, I splash water on my face and it all comes off. I don't really need a cleanser. I haven't used a cleanser in decades. Interesting. Water-based makeup and it just it just washes off with water. Mm-hmm. Um, and do you moisturize? If I'm dry, look, skin has to optimal, uh, function optimally. And I believe there's mm-hmm. plenty of science that shows adequate skin, skin hydration mm-hmm. yields healthy skin and, and and your skin is a, is a barrier right it pr- protects us from from microorganisms bacteria mold fungus allergens um, ultraviolet light and it will perform best if it's if it's hydrated uh my analogy is when you go for a long car ride you like to put air in your tires again mm-hmm. when it's when it's maintained well so if your skin is dry and you'll know you'll see flakes or scales you'll know it's dry yeah. Um, sure, you should moisturize, and a well-formulated moisturizer. Uh, the, the skincare industry makes lots of them, uh, and they're and they're affordable. So I, I moisturize when and if I need to moisturize. That's really interesting. I mean, I'm tempted almost to give it a go. I just, <laughs> it's just just so far from where I've come from. I've simplified my routine, but I'm thinking, my goodness, that really is the that's going the extra mile. If I just didn't use anything on my face and just. Uh, rinsed in the shower and put my sunscreen off on and it would be interesting to see what would happen to my skin that's for sure give it a shot you'll see it's like uh it's uh it's uh, it's just not necessary again these are cultural and I'm, I'm asking people think about it who who decided we needed cleanser on our face now if you have oil-based makeup you mm-hmm. might want to put a mild cleanser on your face because you're going to have a really dirty pillowcase and you're going to be doing yeah, a lot of exactly, laundry yeah So that's a separate issue. But as far as skin health, remember, I'm talking about wellness and I Mm -hmm. prefer to discuss and emphasize wellness over beauty. Not that I don't have anything against beauty, but to me, wellness is is, is priority. Well, I mean, that's that's an interesting one. I was going to ask you about that because, um, you know, I mean, I've just turned 50 and um, I, I made the point in in a video about my you know my routine at 50 and so on that I I have simplified it over the years but also I think it's kind of disingenuous to talk about skincare and what gets results if you're not talking about lifestyle because I think so many of the big um skincare influencers you know particularly in that kind of anti-aging sphere um so much of what we see is lifestyle um, that they're wearing on their face, that shows on their faces. And that goes, you know, for diet, exercise, mindset, the lot. I know that you you think that is important as well. Do you think it should almost be integrated into dermatology? And maybe this is something that you're doing so that if somebody is coming in uh, with a particular issue, you're looking at the root cause of it rather than just what you can put on topically. I think most programs will teach the skin is an organ and it parallels a healthy a life, a healthy body. I think that's I think that's inherent in in quality dermatology programs. Mm-hmm. What isn't what isn't inherent is the study of chemistry and the study of cosmetic formulation um, or the different really the study of cosmetics per se. Um, you know, cosmetics in, in, in this country, in the United States, um, are articles that are intend to um, to adorn or to beautify, they mm-hmm. don't intend to change the structure or function of a particular organ. In this case, we're talking about the skin, nor can they mitigate, pr- treat or prevent disease. And it's very similar in the UK, right? In, mm-hmm. in the EU. Mm-hmm. So what we're talking about here are cosmetics, mm-hmm. not the tretinoin, but certainly retinol and all these anti-aging products that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. These are cosmetics, which by design, Skincare companies aren't intending to change the structure or function of. They can't by law. Yes, they try to push the limits, but they they can't really intend to change anything. And so, you know, we talk about this anti aging thing. And you said as you hit fifty, and I I'm, I'm now sixty one. Um, we really have to open our eyes about this aging process, which is a process. Mm-hmm. It's been made mm-hmm. into a battle, 
right by it by, mm-hmm. by our marketing and our, our culture but it's really a process it's not a battle and and it's inevitable but and i think as you get older that's what you come that's what you come to terms with yeah i think that's right and you know sometimes when i'm talking about my um you know anti-aging routines and all the rest of it, people come on and go you can't fight gravity and you know you're getting older get used to it um and these are just some of the nicer ones but i um I do think that people now um, understand that by that that through lifestyle and to a certain extent through you know how you treat your skin, um, you can look and feel better for longer. And I think that's where a lot of people want to get to. And that's maybe not so much a battle, but they recognise there is a lot they can do. So it doesn't have to be a rapid decline. Lifestyle is key. Genetics, we can't also downplay the role of genetics. Yeah. You know, if you won the genetic lottery and healthy skin and good skin, God bless you. But, but, and you have no control over that, but you yeah. have control over lifestyle. And that includes not only what to do, I mentioned mm-hmm. exercise, healthy diet, um, sleep. I also, we have to discuss what not to do, which mm-hmm. includes smoking. Um, we can talk about the effects of sun, which is what your questions are always about with tretinoin. Everybody's b- battling that, the, mm. the damage from sun. Well, prevent the sun. The number one cure for the anti-aging, photo-aging signs on the skin is prevent the damage to begin with. So mm. if we can incorporate that into our young people, they won't be in the position we're in to try to reverse something that we could have reversed by wearing sunscreen many moons ago. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, you mentioned tretinoin there and um, in in the book, um, you pretty much say that prescription retinoids are, are not what they're cranked up to be. Um, although you point out they can be very helpful for treating certain conditions like acne, but you add that the studies show few cosmetic benefits are really supported by clinical results. So, I mean, do you see no benefit at all for using prescription retinoids for anti-aging? Or would you use them for, would you recommend them for a limited period of time? Or how, how do you approach it with patients? My experience, I've been doing this a long time. Again, I don't sell anything. I don't work for any particular company. Mm. Um, I, again, try to emphasize wellness over beauty, but I have patients who come in and they want to try something. I have Mm -hmm. no opposition to them attempting to use tretinoin, the prescription strength, um, gold standard anti-wrinkle cream, if you want to choose that. But my personal clinical experience mimics, which is the most compelling information, which I find is actually on the package insert of the book itself, of the, uh, of the drug itself. And, and it's in the book. When you look at the studies, they, they talk about four different clinical studies. Um, only about 10% of women who used tretinoin with sunscreen got a moderate improvement. Now, they used 279, I believe, individuals who used the tretinoin with sunscreen and compared that to 280 people who only use sunscreen. It's a great. It was a great study because now you're comparing sunscreen with retinoids, which is what mm-hmm. a lot of people want to do. And when you see the difference, it's minuscule. I'm not saying it's none. There was some benefits to, to tretinoin in a small minority of, of, of people, which is mimics my experience in my office. So after 30 years, I will tell you, there seems to be a small group of women, and I want to say 10%, mm-hmm. who love tretinoin. Yeah. They love it. They swear by it. They want to keep using it. And to which I say, fine, use it. Mm-hmm. But I can tell you something, almost everybody not only in my experience, but also in the studies that were reported by the FDA, almost everybody experiences dryness, redness, cracking, some sort of what we call retinoid dermatitis. Mm. Um, To a point where in the studies, about 32% had to stop temporarily, or they began using steroid creams to mitigate against this reaction, which for some is temporary. And for others, Mm. it goes on for months, if Mm. not longer. So now I have to weigh the benefits, uh, the advantages and the disadvantages of a product that will have a 10% improvement or you have a 10% chance of having a moderate improvement. Now you might want to use steroids. I have people come into my office, they're using fluorinated steroids on their face. Talk about skin thinning. There's evidence to show fluorinated steroids after a week can cause some skin thinning. Uh, Were they using that to to allow them to continue using tretinoin? Yes, but it could go on for weeks and months. Yeah. So you really have to question whether the advantages of trying to make this retinoin um, work for you over yeah. 
periods of time. And that's my point. There are people who are going to use it and they're going to people who like it and I'm okay with letting them try it, mm-hmm. but it's not most people. It hasn't been my experience. I was one who personally, I tried it for months and months and months. I never mm-hmm. got used to it. Mm-hmm. I was red. I was flaky. I'm like, what am I doing this for? Yeah. It got to a point where the benefit did not weigh the risk. Remember it's time, energy, and money. And I just choose to spend it doing something else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, similarly, I used it for about 10 months and I saw a lot of benefits to begin with, particularly in um, tightening pores, you know, just general uh, skin clearing and smoothing. I I did. But I felt that that my skin was still uh, breaking out into patches of dryness and was sensitive and it just wasn't going away. So are you using it now? No, I'm not. I'm not. Um, Your skin looks fantastic. Thank you. That's what good lighting does as well. (laughs) You know, what's also interesting. I talked to a lot of my colleagues. Yeah. Do you know, I'd say over half of them don't use retinol. Dermatologists. No, I mean, some do, but a lot Mm -hmm. don't. So if these experts all believe that this is the really end all be all, why aren't the overwhelming majority or many of them? I don't have an exact number. Why aren't they using it? I'm not using it. I was on the phone this morning with a very, very bright dermatologist from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And I asked, I said, are you using it? Nope. Did she say why? Uh, There are two reasons people don't use it. One, um, they don't find, they don't like the irritation. Yeah. And two, um, they're not motivated to do it, which I think it's related. You're not motivated because you don't find the advantages so and outweigh the disadvantages. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So, so, you know, again, I just think clinically and anecdotally, there's so much time, energy and money worrying about whether it thins the skin or thickens the skin. Yes. In a Petri dish. There is no doubt tretinoin has effects, gene rearrangements. There, I'm not arguing any of that. And there are benefits. There's there's benefits to keratinization, uh, sebum production. So in somebody who has acne, for example, where the benefit will outweigh the risk because they have an actual medical condition, I'm absolutely, I'm on board with it. I think it's a fantastic option. Yeah, yeah. But we're talking about using it for a, for a, 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 a trivial imp- skin imperfection which in my opinion, and I have science to show some of it, could also be improved with sunscreen. There aren't a lot of long-term studies when it comes to tretinoin. So there's a lot of long-term prescriptions yeah. where people are being, pre- yeah. they're being prescribed this for decades, but we don't actually know what the, the long-term impact is. And maybe it's not very much, I don't know, but it just, I find it curious. But you know what your clinical long-term experience has been. And I would say my, my experience, most women, not all, but most women's long-term clinical experience is not positive with tretinoin. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's one that's going to run and run. Without the studies, it's just going to, yeah. yeah. It's just going to roll on. And there, there, there's always going to be the camps of people who just absolutely love it and swear by it and, and um, the other people. The ones I'm, I'm more concerned about are the people who, I think I was probably in that camp for a while, who've just felt that they had to keep going because that's the thing to do because it's the gold standard. So you're going to do anything. You're going to do this. You're, succumb- you're succumbing to, to to cultural norms and peer pressure and marketing. This is what I have an issue with. You're yeah. fabulous. You're accomplished. You're kind. You're all the things that matter. And I don't think you need to spend all this time, energy and money on some trivial skin imperfection. So that's that's exactly the big picture. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's pretty much where I got to. And, you know, I thought I've, I've had enough of this, <laughs> throwing this one in. Um, sunscreen. It, it's it's just whenever I, I talk about sunscreen on, on the channel, you know, if I did so, something dedicated to sunscreen, it would be guaranteed to bomb because people just think, oh, that's boring. Sunscreen, that's a boring basic. But I mean, have there have you seen um, studies that point to, you know, in the same way we look at something like tretinoin and talk, and talk about collagen synthesis and all the rest of it. I mean, are there some exciting things that, that sunscreen can do for us? There are, you know, in 1995, Boyd had a great study. He, um, they, they, they compared sunscreen versus a vehicle in 46 patients. And there were significant differences in solar elastosis, which is the breakdown of elastin in the dermis, mm-hmm. um, which is where most of the wrinkle formation is occurring. It's the breakdown of the proteins, right? The collagen and the elastin in the dermis. And so here we have great studies that show the benefits. Um, Adele Green, she did a great study. Uh, when was her, her study? Um, a while ago, she took 900, 900 individuals, 450 of them used sunscreen every day and they were told to. The mm-hmm. other 450 weren't told not to because that would, she, I guess she would have deemed that would have been unethical if she said, don't use sunscreen. She then compared with microtopography, textured and all, 
And the ones who used sunscreen for four and a half years had no evidence of photo damage uh, aging on their on their on their backs of their hands um, at all. Wow. And there's a lot of good evidence, but you hit the nail on the head, Claire. It's not sexy sunscreen. No, it's not easy. It's not a quick fix, but it is the answer. And there's yeah. science to show it. And it's you don't have to worry about all that irritation and, and all that putting steroids on your face. And um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think the benefits, the advantages of wearing sunscreen every single day, 365 days a year outweighs any risks. Um, yeah. I'm so, okay. you know, it's not the sexy answer. That's why you get the the, the backlash you get. Um, you know, you mentioned your colleagues earlier uh, when we were talking about uh, tretinoin and some of them not using it. But I mean, what, what response did they did you get from colleagues to your book? Um, I mean, do, do yeah. you think most of them were on board with you or? Yeah, I get the quiet calls. I get the calls like, wow, this is great. You know, I don't sell anything. I've been you have guts to do this. I, I've gotten so much support from individually, individually, uh, colleagues, um, pathologists, cosmetic chemists, you know, Mm -hmm. people who are interested in science, people who are interested in, in, um, being open-minded, they have welcomed my, my book, my philosophy, patients. I get every day I get emails, um, messages from consumers. I have just simplified my life. I feel liberated. Uh, remember, these are cosmetics, Claire. You remember, I'm, yeah. I'm, I talk mostly about cosmetics more than just tretinoin, but um, it, it's liberating to not have to feel you're inadequate because you don't use the anti-wrinkle cream or the anti-aging cream or the brightening cream or the eye cream and the neck cream. and the. I mean, it's out of control. And mm-hmm. these are all moisturizers, these products. Yeah. Not tretinoin. That's, that's a prescription drug. Um, yeah. But the, the, the feedback has been great. I've had reps from some of the major companies come into my office mm-hmm. and be th- and 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 work with me and thank me you are so right and again these aren't bad products they're good moisturizers which we need if you have dry skin and mm-hmm. they make great sunscreens it's, we need this industry we need it very mm-hmm. badly we just don't need all the marketing hype and- yeah yeah there is just such a um, there are enormous number of products out there now an enormous people- number of brands yeah and people who are worried about so much chemical exposure Oh, I have a real simple answer for you. Stop mm-hmm. using so many products. You just don't need yeah. them. In terms of moisturizers then, um, from all these things that you've tested, you, you've got a site. What, what, remind us of what your site's called again, where you where you test the different products. Yeah, the site is called Fryface, F-R-Y-F-A-C-E, fryface.com. And I have a corneometer in the office, which is a machine that measures through electrical conductance charge, and we can measure how much water content. It's a reflection of water content in the skin. So we basically test on baseline. We tell our patients not to use anything for three, four days. Mm -hmm. They cleanse the way they normally cleanse. So we test them the way they live in normal customary conditions. We then use two different products, one on each forearm every morning and every evening, and they go home for a week and do that. And they come back and we retest with mm-hmm. corneometry, how much water is in the skin. And when you do these comparisons year after year, uh, decade after decade, I've got hundreds of comparisons. And I've tested everything from anti-aging creams to eye creams to night creams to the typical ones, retinoid creams, uh, you know, retinol, retinaldehydes. Um, I'll tell you two things. Um, how well these work, in my opinion, really has to do with how good of a moisturizer it is. Right. And mm-hmm. two, there is absolutely no correlation between what you pay for a moisturizer and how well it works. Yeah. And that's just after decades of doing this research, I can tell you those two things with pretty good certainty. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, what comes out top? Oh, there's a lot of really good ones. I mean, um, I've started actually putting it on the website that this comes, you know, high, high measures highly. I just finished one. Uh, I just finished one this week. Um, Curel tested really well. Where Curel. One of the, Curel, yeah, it was in a healing one. It did really well. I mean, it was, I mean, it's really, it's really low humidity now and it is testing really high. Um, in more than one patient. So we don't just do one patient. I like to do several to make sure mm-hmm. it's not just an outlier. Like I said, good science has to be reproducible. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, you know, another well-known brand didn't do so well that people are paying a lot of money for. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to throw them under the bus, but um, there, there's, uh, and, and you know what? I'm not going to put that product on my website. So yeah. it's just, it, it doesn't get you adequate hydration in New York anyway, in February. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's uh, that's at least it's objective. It's an objective way to measure effectiveness of 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 products. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, I'm sure there are uh, 
products. I, I talked about this with a skincare founder actually, who who sells um, very inexpensive, well made mm -hmm. um, skincare products, and um, she was saying that so much of what you pay for with the really expensive ones is just the marketing and the packaging. That's what you're that's yeah. what you're paying towards. And I mean, I, you know, we know that, but. <laughs> Right now, they do throw in some ingredients. You know, peptides are expensive. You know, we talk about hyaluronic acid. It's a great molecule, but it's expensive and it doesn't do anything more than glycerin, which is inexpensive. But yeah. it's got that great marketing, marketing, uh, you know, pull. And it does increase the cost of a product because it's a more expensive. I think it's like $200 for, 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 you know, I forget how big the vial is, but compare that to glycerin, which you can get for $2 yeah. for the same yeah. amount. It's, it's magnitude is more expensive. So, you know, but for most part, you're right. The price of a product has more to do with marketing, packaging, and sometimes fragrance. Um, none of those things, I think, makes a difference in the efficacy of the product. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your time. I know, I know that you'll be busy and I'm going to go and have a sneak peek now at the site to see which, <laughs> which moisturizers are coming up top. <laughs> Listen, it's been my pleasure. I hope you enjoy the book. Visit the website and... Um, it's uh, always in good skin health to you. You look fantastic. Thank you. And you too. You take Thank care. You. Thank you for talking to me. You're welcome, Claire. Have a good day. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview. Dr. Fry says in her book that while pretty much everyone knows sunscreen helps prevent sunburn and decreases the likelihood of skin cancer, most don't know that sunscreen, bar none, is the most effective over-the-counter product to enhance and improve the appearance and health of our skin, in her opinion. And as if we needed proof, take a look at this photo of a 92-year-old woman. It was first published in the Journal of the European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology. And this lady used sunscreen, but only on her face for 40 years. And just look at the extraordinary difference between her face and neck. The skin on her face is incredibly smooth and unmarked for her age, in contrast to the considerable photo damage on her neck. And that's all down to where she wore sunscreen. The Skincare Foundation claims around 90% of all visible changes to our skin are caused by photo aging. So after I spoke to Dr. Fry, I hopped on over to her Fry Face site to have a look at the products that come out top. And again and again, you're seeing brands like Neutrogena, Olay, Aveeno, and interestingly, La Roche-Posay, and they feature in both the moisturizer and sunscreen sections. So I'll list a few in the description below along with a few of my favorites. I've got a couple of chemical sunscreens in there, including the one I've used for years, which is Paula's Choice. And it's just brilliant in the sense that it's lightweight, non-greasy, sits really well under makeup and is highly effective. But I've also been impressed with this zinc-based broad-spectrum SPF 35 sunscreen from vegan skincare brand Versed. And I find it's lightweight, it doesn't leave the dreaded white residue. I've seen other reviewers say it doesn't sit well under makeup and left their skin looking greasy, but I've had no problems with it at all. I'm wearing it today and I like it. It's only around £20 in the UK and $25 in the US. One of the top sunscreens listed on Dr. Fry's site is Neutrogena's Sheer Zinc Oxide SPF 50. It's pretty popular with consumers on Amazon, where I'll link to it, but there are quite a few comments saying it leaves a white cast, and so you have to be careful about how it's rubbed in. Also on there is Aveeno's Positively Mineral Sunscreen Stick in Factor 50, formulated with zinc oxide. Again, looking on Amazon, there are quite a few complaints about the white cast, but it is effective. And I'm also a fan of Baby Gannick's Factor 50 Mineral Sunscreen, which I use when I'm on a sunshine holiday. It's unscented and pretty lightweight for a physical sunscreen. If you rub it in enough, you can just about avoid the white cast as well. It's definitely one of the better ones on that front, I think. So when it comes down to it, we don't have to pay a lot for the greatest anti-wrinkle cream of all. And sometimes we just need a reminder that when we get caught up with all the latest anti-aging products out there, that good old sunscreen is the one that's probably gonna make the biggest difference if we use it over the years. We just need to remember to apply it to our faces and our necks. So let me know which daily sunscreen you use in the comments section. I always like to hear your tips. And for now, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.